Okay, so welcome to a, another featured business brought to you by your host, James Moffat, myself, and Visibility Impact. Today's guest, our 82nd guest, is Cara Golding. You are our 82nd guest, so welcome. And Thank you. We're just gonna, we're just going to take you on a journey of basically from childhood to where you are now. Any trials and tribulations, roller coaster road, turning points in your life, anything you want to share. And we're just going to extract some information from you and also learn a lot more about where you are and in your business now. So on the journey, we do like to interact. The whole idea of this is interaction. So we invite people to join. So these are typically previous guests like Boyan, right? Who's been a previous guest. And then he likes to join in and see who the new guests are. So welcome Boyan and Kara, welcome to the show. So if you can just tell us a little bit about you. So where are you now and where are you originally from? So I'm in the U.S. I live uh, just outside of San Francisco, about 20 minutes from San Francisco in a place called Marin County and just over the Golden Gate Bridge. And I uh, originally am from Arizona, which is a state not too far um, away from California. Uh, it's a very desert climate as compared to San Francisco is very hilly, very green. And uh I have been here now for most of my life in San Francisco, moved here during uh, the 90s uh, when I was in tech and uh, was with a startup that was a Steve Jobs founded startup inside of Apple doing kind of the early days of, of direct to consumer right. and okay. shopping. Just, just before we go into the business, I want to take you back down memory lane. Sure. to when you were old. So growing up, did you have any siblings? I had uh, four siblings. I was the youngest of five. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, Brother, uh, brothers, sisters? Two brothers and two sisters. And, uh, and yeah, I was, I was the youngest of five. And uh, depending on who you ask, uh, the most spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> of all of them and uh and uh of course I didn't think that uh, but um you know I think that growing up the the baby of the family I would I had the benefit of being able to see siblings uh do things before me I always wanted to get a job I wanted to have money to go to the mall I uh wanted to be bigger stronger all of these things but I you know, remember always asking questions and being curious and being very inquisitive, par partly because I think I wanted to um, be bigger and be older and want more responsibility. So anytime uh, any of my brothers or sisters' friends came over, they were fair game. I would constantly be asking them questions about what they wanted to do, where they were going to go to school, what did their parents do? You know, why did they like what they did? I was always that kid. Was there a big age gap between kind of the eldest and, and you? It's a good question. My, I have a sister that's 16 years older than me and wow. a brother that's 15 years older than me. And then my parents took a break and then they had almost another family, all, sa all the same parents. And I have a brother that's three years older and a sister that's two years older than me. So uh, I was actually just with my sister uh, who's 16 years older than me. And it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I think back at, at, on, on those days. I mean, I, I probably, she was more of the babysitter and, and we were probably less alike in, in many ways. Uh, my brother, on the other hand, uh, who's an attorney now, I was constantly uh, following him around because he was kind of the cool kid and he was always doing things that were very in many ways entrepreneurial although he's an attorney today I mean he's he was uh he was constantly um fixing up cars he decided that he could fix up cars and uh sell them so he would buy old Volkswagens and he would fix them up and then he would sell them and I would constantly be talking to him about 
why he bought this one and why he chose the color that he was painting it and uh, you know why he put the different stereo in and and so things like margins and a constantly you know that was that was uh, for me the the experience the learning experience that I was gaining from him at a very young age. So do you think entrepreneurialism is in the family? Well, it's interesting. My father was never an entrepreneur, but he founded a product inside of a large company called Healthy Choice. And I talk about his story a little bit in the book uh, because I always wondered why he didn't go out on his own and start his own company because he was constantly coming up with ideas, um, even ideas that weren't food related that he couldn't launch within the company that he was uh, working in. And, you know, it's interesting because he never uh, said to us what the reason was, but, you know, years later, I really started to think about it and having five kids and wanting the life that he wanted for us uh, was his priority. And so he wanted to be able to put food on the table and you know, a roof over his head. He was obsessed with all five children going to, to university. And uh, it was, you know, that was his priority. And so I think by the time he actually figured out that maybe he would want to go start a company, he didn't feel like he had no it was money an left. Option. Right. But on the other hand, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that he never was bitter about it, at least to us. You know, he didn't share with us that if I didn't have five kids, you know, that then I would go and start my own company. Instead, he made the best of it. And uh, he started uh, this company, Healthy Choice, inside of originally Armor Food Company, if you're familiar with that, and then ConAgra, which is a major um, international wow. company. And uh, so, you know, today it's still, you know, alive and well and, and an amazing, um, you know, you, company. You, your dad didn't want you to go into the kind of the family business or his business. Well, for him, it wasn't a family business because it was somebody else's company and he was, you know, an innovation person and oh, developing right. a company, developing a product inside of a company. But, you know, it's interesting. He was alive when I started Hint. And I think he was very excited that one of his five children ultimately did something a little close mm -hmm. to, to what he had been yeah. doing. But it was fascinating because... I remember when I was trying to get our product into a major conventional grocery store and I went to him, we started out in specialty stores. So there's a chain of stores in, in the U S called whole foods, which is a, you know, big national, uh, specialty food store, better for you. Um, pretty, pretty foods, organic, all of that. Uh, and so we started there, we were doing really well, and I wanted to get the product into conventional grocery stores. So there's a store called Safeway that I really wanted to get it into. And I went to my father and I said, how do I get our product into Safeway? And he said, I have no idea. And I said, oh, come on, you know, of course, you know how to get a product into a store. Granted, your product was in the frozen food section versus the beverage aisle, but you must know how to do it. And, you know, he sort of educated me on the fact that when large companies get into these stores, it's really because they've paid a real estate vig, right, in order to be on the shelf. And then they have a slew of products that live underneath, you know, ConAgra or Coke or Pepsi or whatever it is that they sort of place into the sections within the stores. So he had no idea how to go and convince a buyer that there should be something outside of, of those major brands. And so, you know, it was interesting when I finally got the, uh, the meeting with the Safeway buyer, the beverage buyer, I learned exactly that, that there was something called the planogram. And the planogram not only had certain companies that had been slotted into uh, this planogram, but also 
there were certain categories and there were things like soda and diet soda and water and enhanced water and juice. Mm -hmm. So those five categories, they didn't really understand how to categorize what I was doing. And I feel like I should say what hint is at this no, point. No, not, not just yet, not just yet, because I, I'm gonna, we're gonna get there. But I, I fully understand that because my brother works for uh, a, a big company that basically, I mean, his territory are by uh, the supermarket chains throughout Europe, but particularly with a focus on the UK. So, I mean, everything, exactly what you said is a plan. And, and you it, can't just go in and upset that plan. I mean, they pay it. It's like real estate. I mean, if exactly. you want, if you want on the aisle, and it's a busy aisle, and people are, and then it's I kind okay. of level, then you're going to pay a premium for that, as is if it's a bottom shelf in in a corner somewhere tucked away. Exactly, and so that was really what I was facing. I knew that I was launching a new product and a new company, but I had no idea what I was embarking on was also launching an entirely new category, which didn't fit into these planograms. And so I always, you know, share that story with entrepreneurs because it doesn't really matter what industry you're in if you're launching something that. The consumer has never seen or a buyer has never seen it, it it's not just educating the consumer but also whoever is actually the gatekeeper to allow you to get on the shelf exactly. and if you can't get past that person then it's really really difficult to be successful and you have to figure out a way to get past that point and sometimes the way to get past that point is just to stay alive long enough, have your company stay alive long enough as well, uh, but be able to, you know, really have uh, enough time to create the awareness. And sometimes, frankly, the awareness ends up coming from competition. And when there's more people coming into your space, that's really the time when the buyers start to recognize maybe they should pay a little bit more attention and create some space in their planogram, but also when consumers are starting to ask for product, whether it's yours or product in your category, that's when you start to stand a chance. Yes, exactly. So, and, but just before that, I mean, Zelina has just joined. So Zelina, Z Zelina, you can hear me? Maybe you can just quickly introduce yourself. Just so. Uh, yeah. So I hope I can catch up. <laughs> I know I lost a bit. Um, I'm in the health, beauty, wealth, and wellness space, and I have I help people to unlock their true potential and to live their best lives and to live longer, and feel great, and of course, look ten years younger. So I own a skincare line, all organic, made in Switzerland. I'm the creator of it and um, just launched uh, we have bought eight products and also a superfood line because i truly believe that beauty starts from within and we can heal our bodies within and no amount of skincare we put on it on the top will help us to look younger it all starts within so that's my my little circle 360 degrees holistic approach i'm also a financial consultant so i also integrate that in what i'm doing as well as a health coach which really um, integrate and synthesize really well. And also a beauty consultant. So it's quite a journey in the, in the space. And I, I'm looking forward to listen to you. <laughs> That's more important than what I'm doing. <laughs> and to see how we can you know, connect. And great to always hear someone else's point of view. We are here to learn from each other. And Thank uplift, you. yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, James, for the opportunity. Yeah, no problem. So yeah. I, I invited Selena. I mean, Selena has been a previous guest as well. So she lives in Switzerland as well and has a whole product range of her own kind of natural products, right? And so this is a, I could see a similarity between what you do and, and kind of your turning point, which we're going to come on to in a minute. So just coming back to your story, giving us a hint of what you do right then and then then we're going to come back and, and go backwards again just so we can get to the point of how you came about doing this in the first place so so 
just explain sure. what hint it is sure hint it's it's really simple it's it's not so simple to make but it's a, a an unsweetened flavored water and so it was an un, basically You've got one there to show us i do actually i'm having the peach water right here uh yeah. and so it's um it's only available right now in the u.s but hopefully soon it will we're going to bring it to europe uh, hopefully soon um uh, it's yeah it's it's uh I, you know, we launched, I launched it in my first store 17 years ago this month. Wow. And today it's the largest uh, non-alcoholic uh, beverage company that doesn't have a relationship with Coke, Pepsi or Nestle. And, um, um, and, you know, it's more than anything. I think, uh, you know, people have said to me, is that on purpose? Not, not really. I've just really believed that I didn't launch this company to start a beverage company. I launched the company to actually uh, initially help myself get healthy and make people realize what I learned about diet sweeteners. No, and no. <laughs> yes, because I'm very curious there because I, I, I take this sneaky peek at kind of your story mm -hmm. and you weren't as good looking and as slim as you are now, were you? And you had a skin problem. Yeah. Yeah. So basically my story was that I was drinking uh, diet soda, diet Coke in particular for years, not really thinking that there was anything wrong with that because for me, the word diet equated to health. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was not until I took a couple of years off, as I started to mention before, I was in tech prior to that I was in media and, uh, had never been in you know, the consumer products industry. But when I decided to take a couple of years off and start my family, uh, I have four children. That was when I really started looking at ingredients. And I found that uh, for me, the sort of first stop was sugar, that I didn't want my kids to have just a ton of sugar. Uh, and I thought it was ironic that my uh, kids pediatrician was saying, you know, after uh, breast milk, and I was supplementing a bit with some formula, which I was horrified by the amount of sugar and formula. Um, so I was trying not to do that. Uh, but the, the next stop for, for my kids supposedly was apple juice. And I, I thought, that's crazy, because we're teaching them at a really young age to just crave sweet. And <laughs> as I was uh, monitoring what they were drinking and had some control because I was the one that was feeding them, that's when I looked down at my own habits. And I wasn't having, you know, 12 cupcakes a day or tons and tons of sugar. But for me, it was the diet sweeteners that were causing havoc on, on my system. And causing weight gain or, you know, my inability to be able to lose the weight that I wanted to be able to lose. But also I had um, terrible headaches. I had uh, skin conditions as well that I was I had bad acne that I had developed over the years. So and do, you have, felt, do you have any pictures of you being overweight? I don't right here, but you know, there's, <laughs> there's been, you know, different pictures over time. You know, it's interesting too. I didn't really ever call it out as, um, you know, I wasn't the person that said, oh, I've got to go lose weight or I've got to go t on a diet. I really just assumed that that was just the way I was supposed to be. And because so many people had said, you know, once you have kids, you gain weight and sometimes it's harder to lose weight. Um, maybe there were hormonal changes, all of these different things, but I never equated it to what I was putting in my body. And as it related to my skin, um, something that you mentioned a few minutes ago around skincare, it was, um, I had always looked at what I was putting on my skin. I wasn't looking at what I was actually drinking or eating. And so because I felt like I was a hypocrite, mostly to my own family, that's when I decided I'm going to not drink this Diet Coke anymore because, and just see what would happen if, if there was any dramatic shift. And I promised myself that I would do this for two weeks. And when I did in two and a half weeks, I lost over 20 pounds. I wow. lost 24 pounds. Yeah. In two and a half weeks, which was she, she, crazy. Wow. 
but, but yeah, people, and my people, skin uh, conditions cleared yeah. up and as well. Yeah. And so that was really the moment when I started to kind of get religion around the fact that, you know, changing the diet sweetener was actually really critical to health as well. But I, frankly, I, I, I was surprised by it and I knew many other people were surprised as well. And so just a question to you, um, because I'm not the expert on sodas and stuff. So a diet drink and a sugar-free drink and kind of one that uses sweetness. I mean, what, what's the difference? I mean, and which one is the worst for you? Well, it's interesting because there's a lot of different sweeteners that have, you know, evolved over time. I'll, I'll totally, you know, age myself. But when I was a little kid, it was saccharin, right? And then oh, yeah. there were, um, there were many others. NutraSweet was somewhere in there. Sucralose. There's been a lot of different ones. Today, it's stevia, and, um, and you know, probably the the biggest challenge to consumers is that stevia is natural um, in a leaf form but the problem is is when you actually process it and you put it into a drink um, like a diet soda you're actually you're actually uh, using erythritol with it and so you're changing the makeup right. of that sweetener um, of uh, of the stevia leaf so you know if you're it, it it is it okay to actually call it a natural sweetener it's derived from something natural but it's actually processed because mm -hmm. in order to put it into a soda you have to process it so the biggest problem that i think people don't recognize above and beyond sort of the impact of what the sweet will have on your system is that erythritol is an alcohol and anytime an alcohol hits your system, um, it goes, you know, straight to your liver. And, and if you're having a glass of wine or you're having a beer, then, you know, you know that that's going to hit your system. And hopefully you're not going to have eight to 10 uh, glasses of, of wine a, a day, um, like some people are who are drinking these diet sodas. And so it's, um, it's a, not only a really dangerous thing for other parts of your body that you may not be thinking about, but the biggest thing that has come up that, again, I didn't realize, and a lot of people didn't realize 17 years ago, is that, the, uh, that you know, when, when sweet hits your system, then you're actually producing insulin. So, you're, so just because it doesn't have any calories in it, that doesn't mean that you're not actually producing insulin. So a lot of people talk about these diet sweeteners now, and obviously you've probably heard about a disease called type two diabetes. I mean, yeah. that's something that so many people um, have uh, acquired. Uh, they were not born with it. And yet the majority of people who have type two diabetes today are not having full sugar soda they're smart enough to know that they can't have that um but they're you know consumed by the fact that they're having these diet drinks and low fat and you know lots of things that are healthy perception versus healthy reality um that are not actually not only not helping them to you know potentially lose weight and get their skin cleared up but also uh to control their their type 2 diabetes and other diseases as well so i'm gonna take you back a bit more on, on this journey so moving forward we're going back to to get some of the details so i mean uh, over 17 years you've become quite an expert also in nutrition and and basically the differences between all of these because most people assume maybe like you did initially when you see something diet well it, it must be good because it's not it's not kind of the, the the raw version of it with all the sugar in it. It's got to be something better because it says it, it says it's diet, right? And then then people say, "Oh, sugar free and whatever." And it, it's more of a marketing thing rather than a, a health thing. And you just digressing quickly. I mean, Elon Musk said that. I mean, there, there's rumors that he would buy Coca Cola and he would put Coca Cola back to a the original formula, which I, I don't know if this is just a story, but 
originally it had cocaine in it mm-hmm. and then put the cocaine back in the coca-cola but I, I i don't know i mean maybe that's just the story but it was quite fascinating to know anyway what was the original ingredients but just going back so tell me how did you come about the name hint and i mean it's probably something very obvious but i mean i just want to hear how that all came about and also i mean when i, I read your kind of biography uh you mentioned that you were somewhere that kind of triggered the whole thing off in the first place. And then, so maybe you can just tell us a, a bit more about that, how it all came about. Sure. So I was, uh, I had given up, you know, my diet Coke and I was drinking plain water and was so bored by plain <laughs> water. And I started slicing up fruit and throwing it in water in my kitchen. And that's when I was, I was probably living this way for like a year and finding myself frustrated by just plain water. And when I knew what I was doing in my own house, I thought maybe I could just go to the store and buy a ready-made product that just had fruit, no sweeteners in it, which is what Hint is. And also a still version of this product. I didn't have anything against carbonation, but I felt like at that time, and this has changed a bit over time, but the carbonated versions of of what I wanted had a lot of sodium in them. So that has changed over time, but I really didn't want to swap out my sweet craving for a sodium uh, craving. And, and I thought, Plus, it's, it's going to be very difficult for me to have at least eight glasses or eight bottles of, of this product as well, if unless it's actually um, a still format. So basically, I went into my local Whole Foods, uh, the store where we originally launched, and I asked, how do I get a product on the shelf? I, again, I hadn't been in beverages before, and, and the local person uh, who was not a buyer, he was just stocking the shelves. He asked me if I was referring to the local um, producer program that they had. And I said, sure. Yeah, that's that sounds great. That's exactly what I'm asking for. And he uh, told me who to talk to. And, and so I was off to the races. And, mm-hmm. and you know, one of the things that I share with entrepreneurs is sometimes if you think too much about the end, you'll never get past the beginning, right? That it's, uh, you know, I never really thought of this as starting a company or launching a product. I just took steps along the way to try and figure out how do I get it on the shelf? And, um, and I was having fun doing so, it. So, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. So at, at the time you would have been happy just to be in that one store and see your product on the shelf. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and also just get it on the shelf, right? I hadn't really thought about actually uh, when I actually sold the product off yeah. of the shelf. I mean, that would be a great thing too, but I just thought it'd be really fun to get it on the shelf. And it was, uh, it, it, it was you know, that moment when I got it on the shelf that I, I was actually, uh, pregnant with my fourth child. Um, So I had decided that I was going to launch Hint. And just going back, I mean, you mentioned you've got four children. So boys and girls? I have two girls and two boys. And I was uh, pregnant with my son, Justin. And And when you you said the business has been 17 years. So I mean, the, the, the kids now, they were, you start the business before the kids. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I had three kids at that point, uh, under the age of five, it's, you know, it's another thing people are like, how in the world did you do it? I mean, exactly. I definitely had, I definitely had help. I had childcare. But I think like the one thing that I also share with entrepreneurs is that you have time, right? And, and I think, unfortunately, most entrepreneurs I know, don't feel they have time right? Don't feel they can slow down in some way that they're in a hurry. Um, They need to make things happen. I was just speaking with an entrepreneur I met yesterday who came to one of my book signings. And uh, she was telling me that she had launched a product. And during the pandemic, she had to slow it down. And she had to, 
you know, temporarily close it down that she ran into some problems. And, and, uh, and so she was working at the store um, as an interim step. And, and uh, I said, that's okay. You can bring it back. I mean, you still own the trademarks. You still own all of the things. I mean, you just slowed it down. And she said, that's right. I can still bring it back and it doesn't need to be right now. It could be in a couple of years from now when I get back up on my feet and, yeah. uh, and start to decide, but I think it's an important thing for all entrepreneurs uh, or would be yeah. entrepreneurs to know. Yeah, I am. I'm very, very fascinated about your journey because it, it gets me thinking about kind of the journey that a lot of my other guests have been on as well, launching a product or even services. And then how are you going to make those successful? And particularly in, in an area where you are, there's already an established marketplace and, and then brand names. If you mention like some of the big brands, I mean, everybody's heard of them, they're, they're global. And then you're mentioning something uh, or you're trying to introduce something that, that's going to be not necessarily a challenger, it's going to be something different. And, and then how to place that. And, and also the, the, the challenges then of trying to get that shelf space in a store because they're already mapped out and they, they have their real estate that's sold and the big buyers are, have got the, the premium kind of real estate and now you want to get there not on the bottom shelf and nobody's going to see it you're launching something so how did you do that and, and how did you come about the name hint sure well initially the idea that i had for the the product name was wawa and as my <laughs> husband said, I think you've been spending too much time at home with the kids oh, yeah. trying to describe that they were going to have water instead of juice. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, an intellectual property attorney um, and knew a lot about trademarks and said, you're never going to get the trademark for Wawa. So why don't you think about some other names? And that's when actually he wasn't my favorite person. And I decided uh, to share with him that I was pregnant with our fourth uh, on that moment. So he said, wait, let me get this straight. You're launching a company in a category that you, an industry that you know nothing about, and you are pregnant with our fourth child. And you're going to have four kids under the age of six, and wow. you're going to launch a new company. Really? I mean, that's, that's what <laughs> is going to happen. And I said, uh-huh, that's, that's it. And so I just wanted to let you know that I'm taking $50,000 out of our bank account. I had earned that money uh, uh -huh. in tech. So he wasn't arguing with it. He just didn't think it was the greatest idea I've ever had. And he thought that, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, that's okay. But he said, I'm just going to voice my opinion. I don't think it's necessarily the smartest idea. Uh, but he said, if you're not going to listen to me about anything else, please listen to me about the name and come up with a different name. So that's when I started to think about other names, including uh, the fact that we were giving people hints. We were uh, definitely, um, you know, th this was kind of a hint of a flavor. And somewhere in that conversation in the next hour, I said hint. And he said, forget it. Uh, it's a four letter word. You will never have it, have it trademarked. And um that's when I said, I'm the business person, you're the attorney, please file uh, the trademarks for this name. And uh, we filed not only for the US, but internationally, and we have worldwide trademarks, not Excellent. only on Hint. Um, and it's something that we take very, very seriously. Um, and uh, so we didn't use a naming agency. Um, for us, it was just, it seemed like the perfect uh, the perfect name, perfect word to really. Yeah, I, I think it's perfect because you can you can play on words with hints. I mean, it, it goes with a lot of things. Yeah, and it's very simple. It's very um, you know very visual. Um, it's very memorable, and so so that was sort of the yeah, first. I mean, it's visible. I mean, I, I'm wearing it with yeah. the with the undaunted. And you know the the thing I'll say about about the shelf space. I've got I mean, my it hint. was. There you go. It was I just, not only, I just need the dog now. <laughs> <laughs> it was not only trying to figure out how do we launch uh, this product and and compete against you know the the big guys, but also how do we create the product and how do we get the product distributed? Because 
you know, in, in grocery stores, it's, it's, uh, you know, you've got it. They don't want a bunch of small, um, vendors coming into stores. You've got to actually have one of their distributors and in the beverage space in particular, so, it's so typically how did you do that? But bearing in mind, I mean, 17 years ago, I mean, people were more into the, the sodas and fizzy drinks and whatever anything carbonated and and they, they weren't really into i mean there's more emphasis on well-being and natural yeah, products and everything now but 17 years ago yeah people like their fizzy drinks so how well, did you I have well, a question. I have yeah a question. sure yeah um because i'm you know dealing with that right now for my brand especially the products um, I've been doing all the cold calling to get the brand in the retail stores and there's like so many out, out, out and contact their whatever association. And then you go to the association is in Switzerland and they're like not interested in small brands. How do you like, I mean, it's for me, it's not really daunting. I know because I, from my experience in sales uh, in financial consultancy, you pick up the phone, you make a call, you do the cold calls and you get turned down. You, what's the next step? Keep going. So what are some of the um, strategies you use to you know, pursue it? And what is the best, I'm not sure, well, your strategies for distribution channels and what advice would you give me? Well, it's interesting. 17 years ago, direct to consumer isn't what it is today. And yes. so in I had grown up, I started in direct to consumer very early. I ran direct to, I ran the direct to consumer um, partnerships for a company called America Online for years. So I had experience in that, but I still didn't believe that people would buy in the beverage industry. And they were definitely at that point when I started Hint in 2005, beauty was actually taking off and you were able to do some of this, but in my category, that was not even an option or, you know, especially when you've got a product that has a shelf life that is a lot yeah. less um, than yeah. many of the beauty products that are out there. But I think in many ways, some of the roadblocks that I was running into with these retailers, including the fact that we weren't in the planogram and, you know, hearing a lot of no's along the way, led me to really think about who was my consumer and where were they finding products that were products that they really wanted. I mean, they obviously yeah. uh, were going into places like Whole Foods, um, which is where I initially launched the product. But then I would start to ask these people, you know, what, what, where else do you go to shop? And, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I heard from consumers early on was some of the things that they were trying to solve, uh, including it was the first time that I had ever heard about this disease type two diabetes. And so when I started to reach out to consumers about type two diabetes, that's when I just was curious and I started to ask questions. I said, so do you go to a normal doctor to figure out that you've got endo like, is it an endocrinologist or who, who is actually diagnosing you with type two diabetes and how is this different? How many people have this? Are there any support groups, all of these different channels? Uh, and that's when I thought, well, maybe there's other people in these support groups with these doctors that need to know about what I'm doing. And so I started reaching out to those doctors. I started reaching out to those uh, support groups. There were fun runs. There were things where I could do sampling. And so that actually helped build awareness for the brand. But probably our biggest point that came about for distribution actually came when I was about to give up on this company because I really was getting frustrated by the fact that every time I was meeting with a buyer at Whole Foods, they would tell me that in order to stay on the shelf, I needed to have a longer shelf life. I needed to keep, they, they kept raising the bar. And I thought, you know, this just is every time I feel like I'm gaining success and I'm meeting some criteria, they keep raising the bar. So I, was interviewing for different roles in tech. And one of the roles was at 
a company called Google in the early days. And I was uh, seriously interviewing for a role at Google. And one of the gentlemen that was interviewing me, I had known from my previous life. And finally, I just decided that I was really still passionate about Hint. And I didn't really want to give up on Hint. I thought maybe I might be able to do both roles while I'm building Hint, but I was so busy with Hint that I didn't know if I would really have time. But I decided to be really honest with him and sort of share with him what I was struggling with and what I was trying to figure out, you know, what I was ultimately going to do. And I pulled out a bottle of Hint and it was actually our cucumber water. And he started laughing. He said, I can't believe you're looking at a role in tech and you're actually developing your own company. And I said, I know it's really crazy. I'm just really interested and really curious about it. And he said, gosh, well, I don't know what you're going to decide to do about, you know, our offer, but more than anything, I want to share with you that we just started putting these micro kitchens into, um, into the Google offices and uh, uh, we are putting healthy food, but I don't think we actually have a drink yet. So maybe you want to call this guy and tell him that you've got a drink that doesn't have sweeteners in it, because it sort of looks like the criteria that they're looking for. And so I, I called him, his name was Charlie. I called Charlie and uh, he, he said, sure, I'll, I'll try it. It sounds great. We haven't really thought about it. And I delivered 10 cases. Uh, got in my Jeep and delivered the 10 cases. He paid me for the 10 cases. And the next day he called me and he said, can we get 30 more cases? And wow. I said, wow, that's terrific. <laughs> then the next day he called and he said, can we have 300 cases? Wow. And I said, oh my gosh, I don't know if I have this much product. I mean, how much are you guys going to be going through? And he said, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, this was in a matter of days, they became our number one customer and and so they still are yeah and i mean it's still a huge business you know for us with google i mean obviously many of the offices closed during the pandemic mm -hmm. but they're opening back up again and but i think that that relationship with google just built the brand mm -hmm. and even though we weren't available in a lot of stores people were drinking it while they were at the office and then they started to go into stores for us and they would say, do you have this product hint? And they would give them the bottle from work and they would say, you know, we buy this product and then we would hear from the buyer. So when you have a consumer who's actually requesting your product over and over and over again, suddenly it's, it, they start to pay attention. They listen to them much more than they listen to us. And we became the number one beverage in Silicon Valley. Um, I'll never forget when Sheryl Sandberg, uh, who's the chief operating officer at Facebook, when she left Google, her assistant called me and said she just went to Facebook and she loves her hint. And is there any way you guys could set up an account with Facebook to put hint into Facebook? And I said, sure, of course, of course we can. Yes. And so, um, and so, you know, that continued, that continued with uh, Twitter and LinkedIn and, uh, you know, many, many others. But, you know, I think that the key thing that many of these companies were trying to do, a, a lot of people had said to me, did they know you from tech? And some of them did, uh, but not all of them. And I think that, you know, the key thing was, was that they liked the concept of providing a water that didn't have sweeteners in it that was gonna keep their employees healthy. And many times we would be having conversations, not just with the you know, beverage or food service director, but we'd also be talking about, or we'd also be talking to the person who was in charge of benefits. And they loved the idea that they could actually say to their health insurance companies that we don't stock soda. And, yeah. it, and basically yeah. these employees are here all day long. And so many of them would actually get uh, rebates um, because of what they were actually offering. And so that started to 
uh, that word started to get out to a lot of other companies that they were actually saving money. And so again, they started calling us and then distributors started calling us and asking if we could actually work with them, which is when, when you have the ability to kind of have a pull strategy, I can't say that it was on purpose. We didn't sit there and think if we get into all the tech firms, eventually all the distributors are going to start calling us, but that's what happened. And I think that that is the journey that you'll read in the, in the story of Hint that, you know, sometimes actually just, you know, people always say you've got to keep going. I always say that you have to be doing something that complacency will kill you, right? It doesn't mean that you can't slow down along the way, but you have to keep figuring out what else can I be doing to service this consumer? And whether it's figuring out where they work, whether they you know, have some sort of health issue where they're going to um, someplace to, to talk to others who have that issue, whatever it is. And I think that that is the best that is really the best advice I can give to anybody in any category is, is in figuring out exactly how to build their brand. Yeah, no, I absolutely love your story. And it, it resonates a lot with kind of other people's personal journeys that I've heard as well. And it's about the perseverance to keep going, but also don't try keep doing the same thing over and over. I mean, it's kind of the definition of madness. Try something different and try different approaches. and. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you talk to the right person at the right time, whether that's luck, uh, luck or it was just meant to be, and you get your lucky break, or you, you get a break, I wouldn't say it's lucky, I mean, you had to put yourself out there to, to make that break. Yeah. And and Zelina, one of the things you missed that part, you'll have to, you'll have to come, have ba to come back I in to know. hear it. But, no. you know, one of the things that I uh, share in, in the book as well is that sometimes, you know, you, you have very exciting days in the timeline of your business and you think everything's terrific. Um, that one of our stories is a, around that, you know, terrific day, that terrific success is when we got into Starbucks. I mean, they initially said to us that they were going to do a test with um. our product um, and we were going, and then they decided that they weren't going to do a test. They were going to roll it into all 6,000 Starbucks. We didn't even wow. know how we could, you know, get the initial order together in order to, you know, make that happen. And, and when we rolled into Starbucks, that's when, I asked the buyer, I said, listen, I'm, I'm very excited about this opportunity, obviously, but what is success to you? I mean, what, what will you be happy with? I just, I, I have no gauge as to, you know, what it is that you'll be delighted um, by in terms of sales. And they said, if you're doing one and a half bottles per store per day, uh, then we're happy with you. Oh. And I said, by when? And they said, as soon as possible. So it was, you know, very, very vague. It took six months to reach those goals. And then after six months, it continued increasing. And so after a year and a half, they only had one flavor, our blackberry flavor uh, in all of the Starbucks stores. Um, they, we were doing three bottles per store per day. And so I was quite happy with the numbers. Um, and that's when I got the call from the new buyer. And as I always share with, uh, with uh, entrepreneurs, um, you know, new buyers often want new, they want to put their own mark on things in some way, shape yeah. or form. And so uh, that was exactly the story with this new buyer. She said that uh, they really loved the sales that they were getting off of Hint, but, but they needed space in the case and they decided to go uh, with a different strategy, including food. So they were gonna put food into the case. This is in 2012, they didn't have any food in the case. And, um, and basically it was a higher margin product, higher ring, all of these things. And I said, when, when are you doing this? And they said, next week. I said, what, well, hold on. You can't do that. This is 40% of my overall business. I have product already made that is sitting in the warehouse. I have investors. I have product that's going to go bad. 
And, you know, what I realized more than anything was I was stuck because I had put all of my eggs in the Starbucks basket, so to speak, that mm -hmm. I was really focused on making sure that that business was going to be terrific and not focused on making sure that I had new business. And so I hung up the phone. I, I probably cried uh, for a few days trying to figure out how to get out of this. And then something else that I'm such a huge believer in is that you have to figure out how to, you know, triage, right? And get out of this mess. And I still couldn't figure out exactly where I was going to go or what I was going to do. And then I received an email out of the blue uh, from, from Amazon. And Amazon was launching a brand new business in grocery, and they were going to be delivering um, not just food, but they also wanted to start delivering beverages. And the buyer said to me, every morning, he buys a hint with his Starbucks cup of coffee. And so I didn't know if I should tell him that we were kicked out of <laughs> Starbucks or not, because he seemed confident that we were still in there, even though we had been out for a couple of weeks. And instead, I called him and he said, I need this product as soon as possible. And I said, I have two truckloads of product that you can have now, uh, but you just need to wire me the money. And he said, absolutely, I'll do it right away. We became the number one product in Amazon grocery almost overnight. Wow. So, and we <laughs> never got back into Starbucks. But again, it's a story of sometimes the dots eventually connect, as Steve Jobs uh, so famously said, mm -hmm. where things happen, they seem really awful. You don't really understand why they happened, but I believe that that Amazon buyer might not have ever, I'm not even sure he goes into grocery stores, right? He goes into a Starbucks every day and he, that's where he saw Hint and that's why he wanted to bring Hint in. And so it really does go for full circle because after a year of working with Amazon, Ben, we were killing it. We were doing super, super well. I had a meeting with the buyer, not the new buyer, it was still the, the existing buyer. And he said, one of the things that we really like about Hint is that the ring for this consumer is higher on Amazon, primarily, we think, because they're not just buying your product, Hint, but they're also buying things in other categories. So there's this healthy halo over this consumer where they're buying things Sometimes they're buying diabetes monitors, but other times they're buying health-related, um, you know, bands, or they're buying healthy food products or beauty products that really say that this consumer cares about health. So it's a very different story that we are seeing out of this consumer than the one that is buying Coca-Cola, for example. And I said, that's terrific. I started my company in order to gain health. And so I love that story. I would love to reach out to some of these consumers. And he kind of chuckled and he said, those aren't your consumers. Those are our consumers. And I said, what do you mean? I sell you the product. And he said, you wholesale the product to me and I own the consumer experience. And when you sell into Costco and Target and Walmart and everybody else, they don't give you the data either. And they don't give you the relationship with the consumer. And it was at that moment when I thought, this is why I need to start my direct-to-consumer business. Because it may not be as big as the Amazon big business or any of my other retailers, but if I would have had that relationship with the, with the consumer, then when I was kicked out of Starbucks, I would have been able to write to that consumer and tell that consumer that unfortunately we were removed from the case of Starbucks, but they could still purchase here. And so when you have that relationship, then you're in control. And frankly, as we've grown our product since 2012 and had our own direct-to-consumer business, 
any time where we've had situations where we feel like, you know, they've got us by the throat, we've had to, you know, we have to do what they say, we realize we actually don't need to do what they say, because we could instead go out and market to those consumers that are, you know, by zip code or, um, or, you know, in, in the various states, but more than anything, having that option, having that control, having that relationship with your consumer is so critical. So, mm -hmm. so just that sort of goes back full circle back to the Starbucks. But I think like the one other thing I'll say is today there are more options, right? And I think yeah. that it's not a matter of uh, just going retail like it was, you know, 17 years oh, ago. And I think if you're, <laughs> if you're good at, you know, basically Google AdWords and creating, you know, different ways for consumers to know why you started this company and, and the story behind it, I think that it's critical. And, and I think, you know, also when you're launching in retail, it's really hard to get your message out there, right? You have a, maybe you've got a shelf talker, you've got a very small space exactly. to say yeah. what you want to do. Yeah. So I think that having your own space online and being able to be, you know, short and sweet and clear as to why you're doing what you're doing is critical. Yeah, so I absolutely love your story. And oh, this. There's so much, I mean, I have some more questions yeah. to ask, but I don't want to keep you all day because we've, we've kind of allocated the time and I know you have to get away. And I know it's the start of your day, so you probably get a full day ahead of you. And for us, it's it's Friday and, and we're done the now. The end of the day. How about one more question? Yeah, so... Yeah, well, okay. I, I, I see. <laughs> Zelina, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, no, I'm just to, I'm curious. Are you still on Amazon? Are you done with Amazon? No, it, so we are still very much on Amazon and many people have asked that question because I think that, you know, Amazon for us is just like another retailer and that's how we view them. So many people view them as their online arm mm -hmm. and they, that's how they sell. But at the end of the day, there's many people who just go on to Amazon because it's easy and they buy it and, you mm -hmm. know, or DoorDash or no matter what your product is that, yeah. um, that is out there. I think it, it, there are consumers that are choosing to shop that way. The interesting thing about our consumer is that they may go onto our site and buy, they may even subscribe, but if they walk into a Costco and they see a different flavor or something unique that they hadn't seen online, they'll just buy it. It's an impulse buy. And yeah. maybe they'll go after that and go online to see if it's available. We never guarantee that we're the lowest price uh, we always have on our site everything that we do. Um, so we have 26 flavors. Um, uh, and, you know, we know that most retailers won't pick up all 26 flavors. Yeah. That's not so, what they do. So I'm, I'm just going to... 27. 27. What's that? It's written on the website, 27 flavors. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so... <laughs> I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask you just some very very quick questions and then we'll just kind of wrap it up so sure. the kids your kids right what's the favorite drink a hint of course oh, okay so good it, good answer right? very good answer exactly did they, what what flavor did you start with we had three flavors when we started we had cucumber uh raspberry and also a pomegranate pomegranate tangerine Okay, and now you've got 27 flavors. Yeah. 27 flavors. Wow. Exactly. Okay. It's and yeah, and now that I, I mean, have you banned kind of sodas or, or you drink them occasionally or how, do, how does that work? I'm just not interested in drinking them. We do have a carbonated version of our product uh, that we didn't start off with because we really believe that, uh, you know, water is water. And yeah. I think that it's, um, it is definitely better for people to be drinking a carbonated water than drinking a carbonated soda. Yeah, exactly. And I think that oftentimes people need that stimulation in their mouth yeah. um, with the bubbles. Yeah, no, I agree. So now your husband is, is called Theo. 
Theo is is my husband. Right. Yes. So now now he's seen all of this and and from their original name and everything else. So I guess he's pretty proud of you. Yeah. Well, he joined Hint. Um, oh, so he works for Hint now. He well, he joined Hint early on uh, when I was uh, looking for help to right. deliver cases, and so he became the chief operating officer of Hint and uh, did a little bit of legal work in the beginning as well and became uh, the chief operating officer of Hint. And I think what he saw in this idea was really what I saw early on. It didn't seem so obvious to him in the beginning, but I just really believe that if I could bring a product to market that really tasted great, that um, really helped people to drink water, then they would gain health. And I still think that that's true today. And, and yeah. the consumer stories, um, you know, one other thing that, you know, I share a lot with entrepreneurs is when you're, when you're working on a product that actually changes people's lives, right? That they're coming to you and they're saying to you, yeah. gosh, my, you know, I never was able to feel this good. I never was able to look this good. And, uh, and, you know, I, I really, really look at my experience with Hint as something that was game changing for me. I mean, that's something where I think back on those days that are really, really tough. And I would go in and read the customer service comments. I would talk to consumers that love what we're doing, all of those things that if you don't have a relationship with the consumer, if you don't really understand what your consumer's thinking about your product, then you know, you're really setting yourself up for a difficult time when you do have those hard days. Yeah. So it's been a, a massive learning curve on the journey because coming away thinking, uh, I'm just gonna give up kind of these sodas and then drinking water, as you said at the beginning, was kind of boring and it needed a hint of something and you added your own flavors to it. And then to go from that kind of idea to where you are now is a massive success story. So absolutely congratulations for that. Thank you. And in your book, which I just need to plug a bit more, I, because I only received it today, I haven't read it yet, right? But oh, wow. this will actually de describe the journey as well of where you started and how, how you've ended up. Exactly. And, exactly. and it's name, available on Audible as and, well. And maybe the name, maybe you can just explain how you came with the name. Yeah, I, you know, I think many people would say to me as I was building Hint that they could never do what I did because they weren't a risk taker. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't, uh, they feared looking stupid or failure, all of these things. And, and people would comment to me, um, you know, you must not be that. And so part of what I thought about in the word undaunted was not only was, was that a description for me that many people had, had said over the years is that I think that there's this um, misconception of entrepreneurs, of people that actually want to go out and try. I think that curiosity is really the key thing that drives these people to go and do, um, you know, visionary ideas, crazy things in every industry. It's not that they don't fear failure or, um, you know, I think in many cases, they really take things to heart and, you know, really want to, um, they really believe typically before the consumer believes. And so I think the key thing that I've seen is that if you can commit to living undaunted and keep trying to figure out how to move forward, um, not stay complacent, that's the real key to being able to go out and launch anything. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we've learned a lot just from listening to your story. Thank and you. I'm definitely going to kind of read the book now because I want to know more. And I, I want, I'd love to see your product on the shelves here in Europe. I would and too. So if we, definitely. If we, if we can help you in that respect, then we're all for it. Because I, I love, I mean, everything to me is about kind of well-being and quality of life. And it, it comes in many different forms. And what you consume is 
every day is a, is a massive influence on your health. And Absolutely. Yeah, I, it's more of an education as well. Oh, well, I drink uh, diet, this and that must be okay. But it's a misconception. I mean, the, the, and, and to have something that it, as a hint of flavor, but it is all good for you. But all your other products that you do as well. I mean, I, I, we haven't got time to go into all of those as well, but the, the deodorant that's the aluminium free and stuff. I mean, that resonates with me straight away because it's yeah. not easy to find them. Um, Absolutely. But I, anyway. You know, I think that, that the one key thing, if anything good came out of the last couple of years of all of us living in this crazy world globally is that everybody wants to stay healthy. Exactly. Right. And it, it just is. And it's so key uh, for people to stay healthy. And uh, and, you know, today that that disease I, I talked about mm -hmm. type two diabetes mm -hmm. is is really, you know, the key thing that kind of keeps people from being able to get out of the hospital with with COVID and, you know, or Omni or whatever you know, the latest thing is, and, and I think at the end of the day, we've got to figure out how our body is uh, processing things. And yeah. if you have health issues, um, you know, figure those things out for you, because I think it's different for everybody. And it's not something that we um, can't pay attention to anymore it's yeah. something it's very very critical no, absolutely and, and your health is everything you don't have a business everything. without your health it's and everything you can't have a life or anything without your health so we have to pay more attention to it so it's not just about what you eat and consume it's also about what you put on your body so i see your your range of products but as i said yeah i mean Thank this is Selena, selena's own products as well here so I could just drink that now. But, you, should I mean, be drinking the, you should be drinking my smoothies by Selena, my yeah. superfoods. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think, I mean, the, the, the reason why we do kind of these shows is to, to bring people together. I mean, learn stories from each other and stories, I mean, definitely inspire educators on that journey because why did you do it? And, and then we're learning as something as well. And the, 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 these stories, to me, in this format, is something that's so memorable and magical that I want to share with other people. I want, I mean, after this recording, I mean, I'll, I'll send you a copy, but it, it's also important that the other guests can also look at this because this is definitely something that like Paul is trying to join. He's in India, so he has a network problem. But I mean... Uh, people love these stories i love them i can't get enough of them and yeah, no, absolutely. and then when you share it with other people it, it gives them the, the well-being to is, be able to and, and very inspiring it's very yeah, inspiring i mean because they, everyone they has it's very similar um journey yeah but you're on a different you know you've been through all the rocky roads and then <laughs> you had the breakthrough and you got that but you still keep going that's so inspiring love it thank really you cool. so thank you. That, well, i have to run but yeah, thank just, you guys exactly. so much for everything and uh and excited to to hear more and hear what you think of the book as well no, yeah. no, exactly so yeah we all will also i mean we can we can plug that we can help each other and we'll stay in touch anyway so we'll the, the idea is Give me some links that we can connect with you as well. And then I will share it with the group of the others that have been on the show. And Perfect. ones that haven't seen this, I'll, I'll give them a copy of the recording so they can they can see it as well. And no doubt they'll be reaching out to you and say, who's that? And they'll just say that they've been a previous Thanks. guest. And yeah, if we can do something also to help you bring the product or products here in Europe, then we'll be more than happy to, to try and help yep. out. Absolutely. All right. Well, great. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.